Good morning. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. I had a super fun topic to research, so I'm excited to share some great images and also some video clips. I'm putting together a playlist on the Dolly Museum's new YouTube site, so if I could just take a second to plug that. We've been compiling all of our lectures online, and I will you know, store all of the clips that you'll see today and some more um, on the YouTube site. So it's youtube.com slash Dolly Museum, easy enough. So, so this morning, I broke down our topic into an outline. What I'm first going to talk about is Dali's early interest and achievements in cinema, his early achievements in cinema, and then surrealist shenanigans, Dali and the Marx Brothers, which is to say how the Marx Brothers can be um, coined as surreal and how Dali could really be the fourth Marx Brother. Um, after that, I'm going to talk a bit about Dali's time in Hollywood and meeting his, his comedic idol, uh, Harpo Marx. And fourth, there was a project that Dali created for Harpo Marx at the Marx Brothers called Giraffes on Horseback Salad. So there are some great details about the screenplays that I'm gonna share with you. And then lastly and briefly, just talk about some other Hollywood projects that Dali was involved in um, in the States. So I start with Buster Keaton who was a legend of the silent film era. And Dali was the first generation of cinema goers, so uh, Buster Keaton was a tremendous influence on him. Uh, he enjoyed going to the movies all the time. And Buster Keaton, um, he was famous for his deadpan delivery, um, you know, his real striking eyes, uh, his slapstick. He did really over-the-top stunts. Um, he was known as the Great Stone Face. And a couple of Dolly's favorite films of Buster Keaton would be uh, College and Steamboat Bill Jr. And here's a picture of Dolly on the left with um, a few of his colleagues at the university uh, in Madrid where he went to school. In the middle there's Luis Buñuel, a famous Spanish film director who you might be familiar with. And to the right of him, the great poet Federico Garcia Lorca. And during this time, before he officially joined with the Surrealists, he was part of the avant-garde movement. And they were intrigued by uh, a lot of the things that the early Surrealists were doing. Here's a portrait of Luis Buñuel that Dali painted in 1924. He was 20 years old. This is during the university time. So in 1929, Dali and Buñuel create a film, a short film, called Un Chien Andalou, or The Andalusian Dog. And here are just a few of the um, stills from the film. And basically, uh, the film is a combination of imagery that came from Buñuel and Dali's dreams. Um, there was no plot, there was no rational plot, and the idea of it was to basically write a script based on suppressed human emotions and to really delve into uh, the dream imagery that came forth. So on the bottom left, you see uh, something very unpleasant. It's um, a razor slicing the eye. Um, on the right, you'll see Dali made a cameo as a priest. Um, he was being dragged by um, the, the film's hero, I guess. And on the top right, you'll see uh, a hand with ants crawling out, and that was uh, an image that came from Dali's dreams. So during the course of the film, we witness you know, the close-up of the woman's eye being slashed, a man dragging a piano, um, two bishops, a pair of rotting donkeys, um, and ants swarming around the palm. So it was really designed to shock and confuse, um, definitely a moment of irrationality. And here's another still from the film um, of the two rotting donkeys. <laughs> being dragged across the room over the piano, certainly um, a shocking image, a confusing image. And Buñuel made it clear through his writings that um, no one would be able to in interpret this except during uh, psychoanalysis. So the symbol, there was no symbolism, um, there was no meaning to it, um, you know, nothing could be rationally explained. And then Buñuel goes on uh, the next year to develop an even more shocking film called L'Age d'Or, The Golden Age, um, which was a surrealist comedy. It's a, a series of vignettes 
Um, basically, it's a couple who um, they attempt to consummate their relationship, and it's being perpetually thwarted by uh, society, by the church, um, by bourgeois value. So it's a, a very scathing attack on the system. And on its premiere in Paris, it was um, there was such a, a riot because of it um, that you know they destroyed the cinema, they destroyed some of the paintings in the galleries. Um, so. These are ideas and, and, and things that Dali will come with, um, come to Hollywood with, these, these ideas to shock, to really create uh, surrealist uh, films, true surrealist films. So in 1930, Dali becomes officially a part of this surrealist group, and this is a photo of some of the key players. Um, Dali in the middle, to the left is André Breton, uh, to the right, Max Ernst, there's Man Ray, um, Paul Eluard, all of them there. And here's an image of Sigmund Freud on the cover of his book, Jokes and Their Relation to the Unconscious, which was written much earlier. Um, kind of a, a great connection here. Um, he attempted to understand humor on an unconscious level, understand structures of jokes and um, how that works as a social process, what makes a joke pleasurable. Um, but Freud was really the leader, the ideological leader of the Surrealists. And in 1934, Dali famously says, the only difference between myself and a madman is that I am not mad. So Dali really talking about how he understands irrationality, and how he, he's living this. Um, he understands it from an objective point of view. And I say this because Groucho Marx also said something in a similar vein. He said that um, the aim of the Marx Brothers in their films was to overthrow sanity and to give the brain a chance to develop. So both of those people very comfortable with the idea of, of living in a rational uh, life. So just to talk a little bit about who the Marx Brothers are, um, there were five, not three. Um, there was Leonard, Adolf, Julius, Milton, and Herbert. Um, their family were Jewish immigrants. They lived in New York City. And they became famous on, for their Broadway musicals. They were primarily musicians. And secondly, they were comedians of the kind of vaudeville type. Um, during the 20s, they, they rose to fame. And then from 1929 on, on, they were mainly in films. And uh, there were really four of them that uh, participated in the early films. And then Zeppo had left after Duck Soup, I want to say. Um, and then they made a s 13 additional films until some of them retired in the early 50s. Um, so it's a lot of vaudeville style of comedy. There's slapstick, lots of fast talking one-liners, just endless barrage of one-liners. Um, and they were talented musicians. They were skilled. There was Groucho, the ultra verbal, you say, perpetually you know, talking jokes, one-liners, gags. And he would also carry most of the tunes in the films. And there was Chico, who was the pianist, kind of somewhere in the middle between Chico and, and I'm sorry, between Groucho and Harpo. And Harpo was Dolly's favorite. He was the most surreal of the group. Um, Harpo always was, he, well, he was mute, but uh, his voice came through with a, um, a horn. He would honk it. And he wore a, a wig. And you can't see it because it's in black and white, but it was bright pink, so it was a fright wig. <laughs> so, um, and he did play, he played the harp, hence Harpo. So he was a talented harpist. He also played the piano, and he was a crazy man. He had, um, there was no repression. He was just constantly um, acting childlike and somewhat violent, um, but Dully just really admired him, and they had a lot in, in common. Um, one of the films that is considered the most surreal would be Animal Crackers, which was filmed uh, around the same year that Dali uh, entered uh, surrealism, so around the same time. Um, a couple of the famous quotes from the movie, one morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas, how he got in my pajamas, I don't know. <laughs> you mind if I don't smoke? And I love this one. It was outside, I was outside the cabin smoking some meat. There wasn't a cigar store in the neighborhood. So. Um, and really, the film, it's, it's about, it centers around Groucho. He's an explorer. He's Captain Spaulding. And he's invited to a party in his honor at a wealthy estate. 
and a painting goes missing and they call in the other Marx Brothers to help investigate and it just kind of goes downhill from there, so. Okay, so Dali uh, wrote in the short critical uh, history of the cinema in 1932, he wrote about Harpo. He was definitely felt a deep kinship to Harpo's antics. And he said, the face of the Marx brother having curly hair, this face, which is that of persuasive and triumphant madness, pushes back beyond the horizon of literary initiations to psychological pseudo-transcendentalism, a look of sweet go-getting that knows no equal other than the alleged look of revolting blind men. Wow. So, um, so you see how, how Dolly can kind of connect to this style of humor. Um, it's slapstick, it's dangerous, sometimes it's almost violent, and um, they were anarchists in a way. Uh, the central idea with the Marx Brothers is that they're constantly undermining uh, polite society, and really that's the connection. And when I was looking for some clips on YouTube, I found something really great I just could not not share. Um, there was a critical theorist and philosopher that um, studies Freud's um, um, what, model of the psyche, the id, the ego, and the superego, and he found a connection between this and the um, Marx Brothers. Dolly admired Harpo's, what he called it was his primitivism. Um, he said he was the least modern of the contemporary figures. And then Harpo himself understands this very well. He says, most people have a conscious and a subconscious. Not me. I've always operated on a subconscious and a sub-subconscious. <laughs> <laughs> and Dali also operated on sometimes a sub-subconscious level. Um, he, in 1936, he delivered a famous lecture, a, a very serious lecture um, in London in a deep sea diver suit, expressing this idea that he was an explorer uh, diving into the unconscious. And while he was delivering this, the oxygen hose that was delivering him air got cut off at some point and he started flailing around the room and people thought it was a joke and they started <laughs> laughing. And somebody had come to just in the nick of time, but um, certainly uh, it made an impression on people as a stunt. And gangsterisms and goofy visions. I decided to include this sketch um, to talk about how Dali is already interested and knowledgeable about storyboarding and, and coming up with scenes and screenplays. It was in 1935, he was in New York, so he definitely was um, um, impressed by uh, this, I, this gangster culture. He was familiar with that. And so the top row of images here are violent and you know gangster but they're also um, slapstick uh, in a way and so in the middle there's also this idea of storyboarding um, it connects also with his idea of a double double images um, and another stunt that seemed awfully Marx, Marxist uh, was the ball on a or the dream ball and he was in New York and Carice Crosby a, um, a friend of high society they threw a ball and the costumes, as you can see, were quite irrational. Um, and there was a little bit of publicity about that, but uh, Gala is wearing a, looks like a, a baby head on her head and some gloves, and um, it caused a bit of a stir because at the time the Limburg baby had been kidnapped and murdered. So it was a little bit of publicity that they, I don't think that they were meaning to do, but um, the idea that they were just Kind of again undermining polite society, throwing a crazy party. Um, there were cows in the middle of the room, and it was, it was a scene. So, um, 1936. By this time, Dolly is known in America. He's on the cover of Time. He's an international celebrity. So Americans are very familiar with Dolly at this point um, for his paintings and also for some of his shenanigans. So, um, the New Yorker cartoon by Charles Rose. Um, later that year really highlights the idea that Americans are already really familiar with surrealism um, Not really mentioning Dolly here, but you can see some imagery that really just is direct the deep-sea diver having a, a cup of soup um, There's the eye uh, Lamp a woman is serving a chicken with a, on a violin. It's it's surreal and to Americans surrealism was fun and funny and absurd So Dolly goes to Hollywood. Um, this is portrait of Mae West. 
And really an idea about this painting is that um, Hollywood is part of the surrealist aesthetic for Dolly. Mae West is part of the apartment. Her hair is the curtains. Her eyes are the picture frames. And you see the, the lip sofa, uh, the famous lip sofa, are Mae West lips. So Dolly said that surrealism, surrealism takes to honey, or takes to Hollywood like honey on explosive giraffes. Some famous Hollywood mustaches, Dolly, and there's Groucho, of course, and Clark Gable, but he explicitly said Clark Gable, not a surrealist, so. <laughs> um, Dolly said that the great American surrealists to him were Cecil B. DeMille for his um, elaborate and over-the-top films. Walt Disney, early Disney, um, the top image of the skeletons, uh, that's part of the Silly Symphony Suite, that was one of the first ones. <clears throat> and then again, uh, the Marx Brothers, and the other film that was a quintessential surreal film in their mind was Duck Soup. So one of, the, one of the important things, though, about Dolly coming to Hollywood is, and he, he wrote to Andre Breton, the surrealist leader, is that he was coming there with an explicit uh, reason. He wanted to take surrealism to the masses, and he wanted to do that through film. So, you know, what better way than to channel himself into a Marx Brothers film? So Dolly got to meet his comedic idol in the uh, late uh, 1936 in December. And they hit it off. It was at a party in Paris. And then Dolly sent Harpo a Christmas gift, which was a harp covered in spoons and barbed wire. <laughs> and Harpo loved it. He, he got the joke. And he sent back a telegram, a thank you telegram, saying, Dear Salvadore, Dolly received wire from Joe Forstall saying you interested in me as victim. Thrilled with idea shooting, now finished about six weeks. If you are coming west, would be happy to be smeared by you. Have counter proposition while you sit for me, while I sit for you. Happy New Year from great admirer, persistence of memory. And he also attached a photograph. <laughs> Just, it's, it's great. So in early 1937, following this, uh, he came to the States um, in exile during the Spanish Civil War. And he actually stayed with Harpo and Harpo's new uh, wife, Susan, for a few days in their uh, home in LA. And Dolly wrote about the meeting uh, in a Harper's Bazaar article. And he, um, probably a slight exaggeration of the meeting, but he said Harpo was naked crowned with roses, and in the center of a veritable forest of harps, he was surrounded by at least 500 harps. He was caressing like a new Lida, a dazzling white swan, and feeding it to the Venus of Milo made of cheese, which he grated against the strings of the nearest harp. <laughs> which is great. Yeah, Harpo was also um, apparently known for sometimes playing the harp in the nude, so maybe it wasn't an exaggeration after all. <laughs> Um, so they met again a couple months later, and they brought the press, and so there's some uh, publicity shots of Dolly and Harpo. Harpo was sitting for Dolly, so they could create um, some portraits, and here's a picture of that. And Dolly worked on several sketches of Harpo, and he also um, apparently painted a portrait called The Laughing Cavalier, which placed Harpo in a... Um, portrait setting. He was a nobleman, an 18th century nobleman with a big cavalier hat. Um, and at this time, Harpo was filming A Day at the Races. So he was going back and forth from the studio. Here's, a port here's the portrait of Harpo Marx <coughs> that is known. And just a few added details that Dolly adds here. Uh, the, um, there's a slice of meat hanging over the harp a Dillonian lobster over his head and an apple on the top, kind of in a William uh, Tell-esque manner. You can see the, the details. And he really captures the childlike, crazy stare. And here's a, an image of Dolly um, many years prior uh, putting a sea urchin on top of his head. The sea urchin was the favorite boot of his father. And in this kind of William Tell-esque way, um, Dolly and several of his paintings uh, painted this to symbolize this uh, breakdown he had with his father. So perhaps he shared this with Harpo. Um, 
pen. There's Harpo keeping it silly for the press. He's painting, um, drawing on a plate. Harpo also painted, so. Um, and during this time, Dolly pitched some ideas for a screenplay, and Harpo was intrigued. So he said, great, let's, let's um, I would like to see what you come up with. And Dolly takes this collaboration pretty seriously. This is his chance to really take surrealism and take it to the masses, just kind of ramping it up a little bit. Um, and you wonder if Harpo ever saw Un Chien Andalou or The Golden Age um, to really see what Dolly was capable of because um, I'll go into some of the details of the screenplays. They are very surreal um, and in the end too surreal for the Marx Brothers, but um, the details were incredible on what was left behind of this project. And this is a piece called Singularities, which I guess could be a companion piece to the screenplays that he was developing. Uh, the first screenplay that he wrote was called The Surrealist Woman, and then he changed it a little bit for the Marx Brothers. So the first one talks about a surrealist woman, it centers around her, and she's living in this fantasy world, and she's extremely wealthy, and uh, the woman's irrational behavior turns much of society against her, and she, she falls in love, or uh, the film's hero falls in love with her, and so he is extremely conflicted about this world of convention versus world of fantasy, and she's, under, she's disappointed to not be understood by this society. So, um, and he understands that, so he declares war against the society to uh, avenge her. And finally, he kind of tries to readapt, and then he comes back to her. And she was, by this point, living in a palace and, uh, of imagination, which had, at that point, it was too late for him to reconnect with her because you know, the society had broken it down. So just symbolizing convention and, and fantasy, living the way you want. Um, so here are some images of the, of the screenplay he was writing. We have the, a French version of the screenplay in our collection, um, which has been translated. And the synopsis was just like how I explained with The Surrealist Woman, except the Marx Brothers were the central figures in this. They were... Um, they were her friends, the Surrealist Woman's friends. And really the plot is not rational and it's really hard to give more of a, um, a, a direction to this. All we can talk about are the details of it, which there are some really interesting ones. Um, here is an image of Jimmy. So the Surrealist Man was Jimmy, a Spanish businessman who fell in love with the Surrealist Woman. Um, Here are some set images. So most of the film would have taken place in a surrealist cabaret where the woman would try to seduce Jimmy. Um, and you'd see the arms would come out and seduce. And here's an image of uh, Groucho as the Shiva of big business. He, with the, with the mustache and the cigar, and he has answering eight telephones. He was very busy. <clears throat> and there is a scene uh, that describes Groucho in this, in this film. Um, he's sitting at a desk and he's scrutinizing a book with a magnifying lens and he's got all these hands and he can't see it though because of light and he, he's grabbing for the light and then um, Chico comes in and said, you must see this new edition I've uh, uh, put on my car. So he and Chico walk down the street to see the car and Harpo's standing there and he says, look, it's a car that rains from the inside. So it was the first instance of this rainy taxi, which he did in 38 for the Surrealist exhibition, which um, was, you know, which took everyone by surprise. The car was fitted to rain on the inside, and, um, you know, it was covered with snails, and it dripped. He's, there's another rainy taxi in Dolly's Museum, and of course, uh, the one out in our lobby. Symphony Bicyclette, another great detail from this film. Um, I, the scene that is described here is Harpo playing the uh, prow of a ship or a giant gondola overlooking some bicyclists and they're balancing rocks on their heads. You'll see Chico is playing the, the, playing the piano and uh, he's wearing a deep sea diver suit. And Jimmy and the surrealist woman are um, reclined here on the gondola looking over this scene. We have Sentimental Colloquy in our collection, <clears throat> which was done for uh, ballet. 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, where we have these bicyclists again with the, the rocks and they're balancing them. And the idea or the, the memory was from when Dali was a little boy and he would spend time in Barcelona at Park Güell and you can see the bicyclist, so this, this image was really stuck with him. Another sketch from the screenplay, Surrealist Dinner on a Bed. Um, if you look closely, you'll see the, <clears throat> on top of the bed there are these, um, they're dwarves and they're holding candelabras. In a previous scene, Harpo was catching dwarves with a butterfly net and then making them up to be placed on the table and then they would change positions every so often. And the bed was um, also the dinner table, so this idea of um, mixing the senses, food and um, seduction and you know the female is dinner and all these really um, sensory experiences. And then another <clears throat> instance of the surrealist bed, he, he took it to the Dream of Venus pavilion that he created a couple of years later for the New York World's Fair. And on the inside it was literally a dream of Venus and Venus, um, she was dreaming also on a 30 foot long bed. Here's a couple of details from that. So you see on the bottom corner there, it's, it's her bed is a dinner with the, the lobsters for, for a meal in the deep sea diver suit. And there is a clip, I won't play it uh, right now, on YouTube of a surrealist night in the forest. So Dully takes the surrealist bed to Hollywood and he creates a fundraiser for artists in exile. And the dinner is on a bed. <clears throat> all lined by uh, animals, and Gala is at the, the front of leading the dinner. And then a piece in our collection, Dinner in the Desert Lit by Flaming Giraffes. So an elegant sketch, um, you know, with this enigmatic detail of the giraffes lit, they're, they're, they're lighting the, the dinner. This could be considered a companion piece to that, Giraffes on Fire which I think is the, the second um, time that Dali used the burning giraffe. The first was in the movie, uh, Lage d'Or, where there was a, a giraffe in one of the scenes. So interesting. And you know, when asked, what does that mean? He would answer two different ways. He, at one point he answered it was slapstick humor. Um, how could that better be expressed than by these giraffes with their burning necks? And then at a very different statement, he said that it was a premonition of the Spanish Civil War. So, finally we have the Surrealist Piano, and it really, what I saw when I, when I saw this sketch was a, a scene from A Day at the Races, which was being filmed that year, of Harpo playing on the piano. So I see Harpo ecstatically playing the piano. Um, so, Dali wrote the, the manuscript, and, or the screenplay, and delivered it to the Marx Brothers at the studio when they were filming A Day at the Races. And uh, according to Groucho, Dali came in and said, boy, have I got a script for you. Um, and they read it, and he said it would not play. He just, they couldn't do it. Um, he thought Harpo really liked it, but obviously the, the screenplay and the details would be too impossible to you know become a Hollywood film. And, would people respond positively to something like that? It was, for one, it was um, very sexual. Um, it was completely irrational. And so it was just, it was not a success. And this was a huge disappointment for Dali. Um, when asked, you know, what happened, why, why wouldn't they, why wouldn't they accept your, your play? He said nobody would dare do Dali's script. And he would get so upset that according to somebody, they said that, you know, he would be, get so furious that he would try and beat pigeons with a cane, you know, he would just, <laughs> thinking about this, this failure to him was, <laughs> so, <laughs> Dolly mourns the project in the autobiography, um, The Secret Life of Salvador Dolly. He said, I salute you explosive giraffes of New York and all you forerunners of the irrational. So there were some Hollywood successes that said. Here's Dolly working with Hitchcock um, during Spellbound. Um, there's just one still of the dream, the dream sequence he created for Hitchcock. Hitchcock said Dolly was the only one that would be able to do this very well for him and um, it was a great success. You see the, the, the backdrop 
reminding you a bit of the still from Un Chien Andalou with the eye being being cut. And there's another scene where a giant scissors comes in and cuts the, the backdrop there. So that was really the, the one success in his lifetime. And then just briefly, the last project that um, Dolly did in Hollywood would have been with Walt Disney. And it was a sequel to Fantasia. Uh, Fantasia was wildly successful and they were going to do a sequel. And he was gonna create a short film and Dolly clocked in and out of the studios and did sketches and, and worked up uh, a short film. And the entire project, not just Dolly's, got shelved. And so it wasn't until 2003 when one of the original animators came back and helped you know, bring the project to fruition. And that is um, Destino, and here's a, an image. And I just saw a connection between the storyline with Destino and really what he had created for the Marx Brothers, which was a story of unrequited love of two figures in this kind of irrational world. And instead of Jimmy, the businessman from, the, from Spain, and the surrealist woman, it's a ballerina and a baseball player. Um, you know, so it's definitely geared towards an American audience. And so here's a, a beautiful still from that. So in conclusion, <laughs> as we could say, Hollywood was often more interested in Dolly's publicity and his stunts rather than the ideas that he would that he created. Um, most of the evidence we have of the successes are um, just a reflection of, of things that he created. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.